Okay. Well, let's head for the home stretch. Now, the um, everything I've been talking about so far involves catabolism, breaking down of glucose or fructose or galactose into uh, smaller pieces. And there's energy gained in that process. What I want to do now is uh, talk about our first anabolic pathway. And anabolic pathways, you recall, involve synthesis. So with what I'm going to talk about uh, for the rest of the period today, I will be talking about the synthesis of glucose and not its breakdown. Now, the good thing about this is it's very similar to the reversal of the breakdown. It's not identical, but it's very similar to the reversal. So if you learn the breakdown, you can learn the synthesis relatively easily. We start with um, an odd uh, thing that your book mentions right here, but I'll, I'll mention it because your book mentions it, and that is one way of making glucose. So this is not a real common way, but it's a possible way. All right? We can take the molecule glycerol. How do we get the molecule glycerol in our body? Well, we get the molecule glycerol from the breakdown of fat. Glycerol is the backbone of fats. Fats are made by esterifying three fatty acids to glycerol. So when we break the fat down, we're left with glycerol. Glycerol can be converted, as you see in the reactions here, and you don't need to worry about these enzymes, uh, to glycerol phosphate and ultimately to um, a, uh, an intermediate dihydroxyacetone phosphate that we saw in glycolysis, and it's also an intermediate in the process of making glucose. So what this pathway is telling us is that glycerol is a potential starting material for making glucose. It takes some ATP, it takes some oxidation, but uh, once that happens, we've got an intermediate we can convert ultimately into um, glucose. Now, um, I mention that because we, in general, as animals, cannot synthesize glucose from fat, in general, okay? We cannot make it from fatty acids at all. We can't take fatty acids and make glucose from it. It's just not something that we have the enzymes to do, all right? We can take the rest, the only other component of fat, which is the glycerol, and make it into glucose. So glycerol is the only part of fat that we can make into glucose. All right. Well, let's look at the process of gluconeogenesis. Now you'll see where that dihydroxyacetone phosphate fits in. And as I show you this, what you will notice is that it's very similar to glycolysis. It starts at the bottom and moves upwards. And we're drawing it in the same configuration as glycolysis so that you can see some very good parallels between the two pathways, OK? If we st the starting point for glycolysis can be several things. One was we saw glycerol here. Glycerol can go in here and then move up the ladder. We can also start with some amino acids and convert them into oxaloacetate, as you can see here. We can also start with lactate or other amino acids and convert them into pyruvate. So for all practical purposes, I'm going to start with pyruvate as our starting material to make gluconeogenesis. So that's what we're going to define as our starting material, pyruvate. All right? But recognize that there are other ways of getting things in. Pyruvate was the end product of, um, of glycolysis. It is the starting point of gluconeogenesis. Now, if you recall the last reaction of glycolysis that made pyruvate, I told you that pyruvate kinase was an enzyme that catalyzed what I described as the Big Bang. It not only made ATP, but it had a very negative delta G0 prime, meaning that if we start with equal concentrations of products and reactants, it will go far in the direction of producing pyruvate at equilibrium. What that essentially means is that reaction is not feasible to directly reverse using the same enzyme. We can't simply use pyruvate kinase and dump in a ton of pyruvate and hope to make very much PEP, which would be the other, which, which would be what um, we would do if we reversed the pathway. 
So instead, cells do what I call a little two-step around the problem. The two-step is they use two enzymes to go through an intermediate called oxaloacetate and then make PEP as we will see. So let me take you through the reactions and explain what's going on. The first reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme known as pyruvate carboxylase. And yes, you should know these enzymes. Pyruvate carboxylase is found only in the mitochondrion. Look at that rain's coming down up there. Look at that. All right. It's found only in the mitochondrion. Now, if you recall what I said about glycolysis, all of glycolysis occurred in the cytoplasm. So here's our first reaction that's occurring in a different location. It means that pyruvate has got to be moved into the mitochondrion in order for this process to start. Okay. Pyruvate carboxylase requires energy from ATP. You can see ATP being, using here, being used here. And it produces oxaloacetate. Oxaloacetate is then moved out of the mitochondrion, back out to the cytoplasm, where a second enzyme known as phosphoenol pyruvate carboxykinase, I'll give you an abbreviation in a second, converts oxaloacetate into PEP using energy from GTP. Remember I said GTP can be used for energy also, and here it's used for energy. Now, what have we done? We have gone through, oh, I was going to give you an abbreviation. So an abbreviation for phosphoenol pyruvate carboxykinase is called PEPCK. People call it PEPCK, PEPCK. PEPCK, as I said, uses energy from GTP to accomplish the synthesis of phosphoenol pyruvate, PEP. Now, we've taken two reactions to get around that Big Bang reaction, one to make oxaloacetate, the second to make phosphoenol pyruvate, and it took two high energy phosphates, one here and one here. GTP's energy is equivalent to that of ATP, okay? And so it's essential, essentially we've used two triphosphates to get past that Big Bang reaction, all right? That's an important consideration, a very important consideration. As we will see, it takes more energy to make glucose then we get out of breaking glucose down. <coughs> okay, it's going to take more energy to do that. Now, we keep in mind also that when we go to make glucose, we have to start with two pyruvates. It's going to take two pyruvates, it's going to take two ATPs, it's going to make two oxaloacetates, and they're going to take two GTPs to make two pyruvates. I'm sorry, two PEPs, not pyruvates, blah. Two PEPs. Okay, well, that's um, a little complicated, but then we look at the rest of the pathway and we see what's the next enzyme in the pathway. Oh, it's enolase. We saw that in glycolysis. We're running the reaction backwards. The next enzyme, phosphoglycerate mutase. We're running the reaction backwards. Phosphoglycerate kinase. We're running the reaction backwards. Okay. Uh, G3PDH, running the reaction backwards. So we run all these reactions backwards until we get up to our friend, PFK. PFK catalyzed a fairly energetic reaction in the forward direction. And so the cells have to find a way around that. And they use a cool trick. The cool trick that they use is they use a different enzyme called fructose 1,6 bisphosphatase. Now, Notice that we see fructose 1,6 bisphosphate appearing in the name, right? But it's phosphatase. Whenever we see ASE on the end, we know we're talking about an enzyme, not a molecule. So fructose 1,6 bisphosphatase, or F1,6-BPase, you can call it if you want, doesn't catalyze the reversal of PFK. If it catalyzed the reversal of PFK, it would be resynthesizing the a ATP that PFK uses. It's not doing that. Okay? It is, in fact, clipping a phosphate off 
to make fructose 6 phosphate. Yes, sir? I'm sorry. So if I said PFK, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. F16 BPA. Sorry, did I do that? Yeah. Sorry. Bah. <clears throat> so fructose 16 bisphosphatase is clipping that phosphate off of F16 BP to make fructose 6 phosphate. It's not producing ATP, which is what PFK would have done. That's the, that's the, in other words, it's not catalyzing the reversal of the PFK reaction. It's catalyzing a new reaction of its own. All right. Then we have the same enzyme from glycolysis running in reverse, phosphoglucoisomerase. <coughs> and we get to the last enzyme that is different. And it is known as glucose 6-phosphatase, uh, glucose 6 uh, which you can call G6Pase. And again, the ASC is telling us it's an enzyme. Now. This last enzyme, glucose 6-phosphatase, is found in the endoplasmic reticulum. So to recap what I have just told you, there are three places where glycolysis reactions are bypassed. They are not simply reversed, because it's not practical from an energetic perspective to reverse them. The first two bypass the pyruvate kinase reaction. The next one bypasses the PFK reaction. And the last one bypasses the hexokinase reaction. There's another interesting component to that. Anybody see anything interesting besides the fact those are energetic reactions that's interesting? Another coincidence, as it were? Those were the three enzymes that were regulated in glycolysis. Part of the reason that they're regulated is to keep one process going when the other process is stopped. We'll see how that occurs in a second. So we're not only bypassing energetic processes, which is essential, but we're also bypassing regulated enzymes. Gluconeogenesis, because it uses two enzymes for that very first one, has 11 enzymes instead of 10. So there are 11 enzymes that catalyze the reactions of gluconeogenesis, starting with pyruvate. Only 10 enzymes catalyze glycolysis. Questions about the pathway itself? Okay. So if you learn the enzymes for glycolysis, you already know seven of the enzymes for gluconeogenesis. All right. Let's take a look at those enzymes. Okay. Here's the reaction that's being catalyzed by the first one, pyruvate carboxylase. Pyruvate carboxylase uses energy from ATP to put a carbon dioxide onto pyruvate to make oxaloacetate. There's that carbon dioxide right there where my arrow is. Okay. Now, this takes energy from ATP, and it also requires a coenzyme. What's a coenzyme? Well, a coenzyme is a molecule that helps an enzyme to do what it does. And the coenzyme that this enzyme uses is known as biotin. I'm sure you've heard of biotin before. B-I-O-T-I-N. Biotin is a coenzyme that is used by almost every enzyme called a carboxylase. Because what biotin does is it grabs a hold of CO2 very effectively and gives it to the enzyme. So biotin is very important for that CO2 component of the enzyme. Okay. That's just, and there's the biotin 
uh, domain of the enzyme, just the place where biotin itself is bound. Not really much to say about that. Here's what biotin does. Oh, I'm sorry, that's where it's located. Biotin is actually attached, as you can see here, to a lysine residue, and it grabs a CO2. So that's what it's done right here. Here's the biotin molecule, there's the lysine molecule, and here is the biotin hanging on to that CO2 that the enzyme is going to incorporate into pyruvate to make oxaloacetate. Okay, the next enzyme I will talk about is the second enzyme of, gly of gluconeogenesis, and that's PEPCK. PEPCK catalyzes a uh, fairly straightforward reaction. It's actually a decarboxylation, meaning it's breaking the carboxyl group that just got put onto there off and causing a molecular rearrangement. Energy from GTP is necessary to have that happen. And carboxykinase, uh, I'm sorry, PEP carboxykinase is interesting primarily in the, in the fact that it's, it is controlled mostly at the level of where it is made. Cells that don't make it don't go through gluconeogenesis. Okay? Well, it turns out that most cells of our body don't go through gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis is a pathway that is fairly specific to our liver and certain cells of our kidney. All right? The rest of the cells of our body rely on the liver to provide them glucose when we're not eating, for example. Okay? So, the liver makes, carb uh, makes PEPCK. Many other cells of our body do not make PEPCK. And that way, its activity and the activity of the entire pathway is actually regulated. Don't sweat this one too much, but it's simply showing you that here's a mitochondrion. We take pyruvate, which they don't even show how you get it in, but suffice it to say, you get it in, you make oxaloacetate, then you've got to get oxaloacetate out, and you have to jump through some hoops before you finally end up with oxaloacetate. Don't worry about the figure itself, but suffice it to say that it does take a several step process in order to get that oxaloacetate out. All right, and the last enzyme that I will talk about here is called glucose 6-phosphatase. Glucose 6-phosphatase is an enzyme that is found in the endoplasmic reticulum. And again, it's not found in all cells. It's primarily found in liver cells. Well, if we make glucose 6-phosphate in the cytoplasm, and we need to get it, we need to expose it to glucose 6-phosphatase, that means we have to get that glucose into the mitochondrion. And so that's what's depicted in this figure. Here's the cytoplasm on the top. Glucose 6-phosphate has been produced by the other reactions of gl uh, gluconeogenesis, and it is moved across a transport protein in the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. And then on the inside, glucose 6-phosphatase cleaves that phosphate off, releases free glucose, and sends it back out to the cytoplasm. Once in the cytoplasm, the liver cell kicks it out of the liver cell and into the bloodstream. Okay? Now, I have a question for you. This is one I've used on exams, and I won't use it on an exam, but I will give you this question to think about. The cell has just gone through a fairly energetically intensive pathway. To go from pyruvate to glucose requires six ATPs. Okay, we can go back and count them, but you don't have to worry about that. There's six ATP or six triphosphates that's necessary if we count the GTPs. Six of them, okay? If we go through glycolysis, we only get two, right? So we've got a problem. We don't want to have both of those processes going on at once, and I'll explain more about that in a second. But my question I want to ask you is this. I've just made glucose. What stops glycolysis of the liver cell from grabbing that glucose and breaking it back down to pyruvate. Any thoughts? Um, What's that? Aldolase? No, not aldolase. 
hexokinase could grab that guy and start making, uh, start breaking that glucose down. Then the body would never get the glucose. Why doesn't that happen? You're making uh, glucose from preservation. Doesn't that mean your body needs it really bad so it would take it up right away? Well, yeah, except for the fact that the, the closest place that the glucose, the first thing it would encounter would actually be hexokinase. Yeah. So does hexokinase get inhibited somehow? Um, sort of, yeah. Okay. It turns out that the cells are doing a trick. Your liver cells have a slightly different form of hexokinase. A very slightly different form of hexokinase. It's called glucokinase. So the hexokinase that the rest of the cells of your body have isn't the same as the hexokinase that your liver has. In the liver, it's called glucokinase. It's slightly different. Okay? Now, if you were a liver cell, liver cells have to, have to make energy too. They have to use glucose sometimes. So how does the cell use glucose sometimes and not use it other times? One mechanism would be regulation. Okay? But the regulation is not really the answer to this. What else would affect an enzyme's ability to catalyze a reaction? Oxygen? No, oxygen won't, won't play in. Say what? Available energy to catalyze it, so availability of ATP? No, not, not quite that either. Let's think about this. What is, why was KM important for an enzyme? What was KM, what did KM do? It was the affinity of the enzyme for the substrate. An enzyme that had a high affinity had a low KM, right? Meant that it took relatively small amounts of substrate to get to half Vmax, right? An enzyme that had a high KM had low affinity, meaning that it took a higher concentration of substrate to get to half of Vmax. It turns out that glucokinase has a somewhat higher KM for glucose than hexokinase does. So it's concentration driven, meaning that liver cells won't start grabbing that glucose until the concentration of glucose gets fairly high. When does the concentration of glucose get fairly high? Once the body stops using all the glucose, the liver starts putting out. Glucokinase allows the cell, the liver cell, to use glucose only in high concentrations and not use it when it's in lower concentrations. It's a very, very useful phenomenon and it's, uh, uh, I think, a good uh, learning opportunity relative to KMs that we've talked about before. Yes, sir? You say um, glucokinase has a higher KM? Glucokinase has a higher KM than does hexokinase, okay? Meaning it takes, it takes more glucose before it'll start using it. Okay. All right. Well, what I'm going to finish on today is actually a little bit complicated, so I'm going to go through it kind of slowly with you and hopefully explain it and answer your questions as we go through. Okay. This looks a little complicated, and what it's showing is on the same figure, it's showing you the reactions that are regulated of glycolysis and gluconeogenesis for our purposes. You'll notice it's not saying anything about the regulation of hexokinase up here. As I said, we're not really going to talk much about that. For our purposes, the two most important enzymes being regulated are PFK and pyruvate kinase on the glycolysis side, pyruvate carboxylase and PEPCK, and F16BPAs on the um, gluconeogenesis side. Now, this regulatory scheme that I'm getting ready to describe to you is the first case you're going to see the phenomenon known as reciprocal regulation in action. And so you need to make sure that you understand reciprocal regulation because it will become important when I talk about glycogen metabolism later and when Dr. Merrill talks about other processes uh, of catabolism and anabolism next quarter. Okay? So here is the enzyme PFK. 
Going in the downwards direction on the left, we're doing glycolysis. Going in the upwards direction on the right, we're doing gluconeogenesis. I told you that if I run glycolysis, I get production of two net ATPs. If I make glucose in gluconeogenesis, it takes six triphosphates, four ATPs and two GTPs. Now, if I have a cell where I have both of these processes going on, here's what happens. Glucose gets broken down to pyruvate. I gain two ATPs. Pyruvate gets made back into glucose, loses six triphosphates. What just happened? The only thing that happened was I started with one glucose, I ended with one glucose, and meanwhile, I lost a net of four triphosphates. Okay, I probably generated some heat as well. All right, every time I do that cycle, glycolysis, gluconeogenesis, glycolysis, gluconeogenesis, glycolysis, gluconeogenesis, every time I do that, I lose four triphosphates. It's a cycle that we call a futile cycle, F-U-T-I-L-E. It's futile. The cell isn't getting anything out of it other than perhaps heat, and it's losing triphosphates every time. It's losing triphosphates every time. Well, that's generally not in the cell's interest. The cell does not want to be having both pathways going on simultaneously. So the regulatory scheme that cells use is to inhibit cyclic pathways, uh, I'm sorry, feudal pathways from occurring. Okay? Well, let's look and see how it accomplishes it. We'll start with our friend fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. As I pointed out to you, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate activated PFK. Look at the effect it has on fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. It inhibits it. Opposite effects, same molecule. This molecule is turning on glycolysis and turning off gluconeogenesis. It's not the only one. Look at this guy. Here's AMP. Turned on PFK, turned off fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. AMP, you recall, was indicating low energy. Cell wants to be breaking glucose down when it's got low energy. It certainly doesn't want to be making glucose, which is what it would be doing over here. Look at citrate. Turning off this guy, turning on this guy. These guys are what we recall, I'm sorry, what we call reciprocal regulators. They have opposite effects on catabolic and anabolic pathways. Yes, Anisia. Yes, it is. Okay, um, I'll answer you the question, but you're not responsible for what I'm going to answer here. Okay, so just, just because you're curious, all right? Citrate accumulates when the citric acid cycle is not running. And it accumulates when the citric acid cycle is not running because cells typically have lots of energy at that point. So if you have lots of energy, citrate is a good indicator of that energy. And if you have lots of energy, you don't want to be breaking down glucose, right? You want to use that energy to make glucose. Make sense? Yeah. All right. So there are other things that regulate it. But you can see that three of those things are actually reciprocal regulators. They have opposite effects on those two enzymes. That's a very simple scheme. Turn this guy off, turn this one on. Turn this one on, turn this one off. Okay. If we go down here, we don't see quite the same phenomenon. Okay? We see ATP turning off pyruvate kinase, and we see ADP turning off this guy. But that, from an energy point of view, sort of makes sense. We don't want to break down things when we've got energy. We don't want to be making things when we don't have energy. Okay? So that sort of makes sense. Now. Um, we all, I've previously talked about fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, how that was a feed-forward regulator, and now you see a bigger scheme about how and why that happens. All right. So the reciprocal regulation of this pathway is not unique. I mean, reciprocal regulation is not a unique phenomenon to glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. We will see it uh, even stronger in glycogen metabolism tomorrow. 
And you will see it also occurring uh, when you talk about fatty acid oxidation and fatty acid synthesis with Dr. Merrill uh, next term. So reciprocal regulation, a very simple concept, very important way to protect cells from having futile cycles going on. Okay, now here's the place where the regulation gets a little complicated. And it gets complicated, I think, because of the names. So I'm going to try to simplify the names with you so as to reduce the, co the, the confusion that students have about the regulation. You might say, well, we've already seen the regulation. Well, you have of the enzymes that are directly involved in glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. But we haven't talked about how it is that fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is made or broken down. And that turns out to be an interesting story. All right. The enzyme that um, makes fructose 2,6-bisphosphate uh, is called PFK2. And it's called that to distinguish it from PFK, which is the one we saw in glycolysis reaction. PFK2 catalyzes the addition of a phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate to make fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Okay, we can actually see that process happening right here. Now, this is a little complicated, so bear with me. All right? Here is fructose 6-phosphate. We see where my arrow is. All right? If we go upwards, we see it's been converted into fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Okay? And the enzyme that catalyzed it is labeled on here as PFK2. So PFK2 catalyzed the conversion of fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Everybody with me there? Okay. Well, what did that do? That made fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. What does fructose 2,6-bisphosphate do? It activates PFK. Okay. So it's just simply showing you PFK here to indicate that this will now go activate PFK. That's going to stimulate glycolysis, and we're off and running. Now, this gets complicated because of the fact that PFK2 is actually part of a bigger protein. This is really, really unusual scheme. Okay? I'm not aware of any other enzymes that are set up like this one. All right? PFK2 is part of a bigger protein. You'll notice the bigger protein has something on it called FBPase 2 and it has a red line drawn through it there. What does that mean? Well, the bigger protein has a different enzymatic activity on it. That different enzymatic activity is called FBPase 2. What does FBPase 2 do? Well, that's actually shown over here. On the right side, we can see that the PFK2 has been crossed out, and the FBPase 2 is not crossed out. I'll explain how that happens in a second. This enzyme catalyzes a very simple reaction. It catalyzes the breakdown of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. F2,6-BP, clip a phosphate off, and you've got fructose 6-phosphate. That was the same thing we had right down over here. So FBPase 2 catalyzes the breakdown of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. The two activities of this enzyme do exactly the opposite thing. Make or break down fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Well, talk about a scheme where you could have a futile cycle we got a prime one right here, right? Make, break, make, break, make, break, make, break. That wouldn't be good. It turns out that cells have evolved this enzyme such that only one half of it is active at any given time. Only half of it is active at any given time. That's what's shown in the middle. How do I make the PFK2 inactive. We'll start with that. How do I make the PFK2 inactive? Well, we can see that what happens is we put a phosphate onto it and that 
knocks the PFK2 out and stimulates FBPase2 to be active. Where does that phosphate come from? Our friend protein kinase A. Protein kinase A attaches a phosphate to PFK2, inactivating it, and thus activating FBPase2. This guy, protein kinase A, you remember, was stimulated by epinephrine. It's also stimulated by another hormone that I briefly mentioned called glucagon. I'll talk more about glucagon in just a bit. All right. Well, how do we convert this back into PFK2 being active and FBPase2 inactive? We have to remove the phosphate. That's catalyzed by an enzyme called phosphoprotein phosphatase. And what makes phosphoprotein phosphatase active? Insulin. Insulin and epinephrine slash glucagon work in opposite directions, doing opposite things. Epinephrine is stimulating the pathway to the right. Epinephrine is stimulating the breakdown of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, which will favor gluconeogenesis and stop glycolysis. Insulin will favor the synthesis of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, which will activate glycolysis and inhibit gluconeogenesis. Now, I know that's a lot of words, and you're sitting there going, oh, wow, this is complicated. And it is complicated. Draw it out. I think when you draw it out, you'll see it's not as complicated as the words that I use to describe it. Now, this generates probably as many questions as I usually get in a term. So I'll stop at this point and take any questions that you might have. Yes, ma'am. Um, when you said the phosphate, so the phosphate has to be put on to inactivate PFK2? That's right. So the phosphate is added to this complex over here to inactivate PFK2 and activate FBPase2. So protein kinase A is inactivating PFK2 because we're moving to the right. Okay? Phosphoprotein phosphatase catalyzes the reaction to the left, which is the activation of PFK2 and the inactivation of FBPase2. Take your time and think about it for a second. It's, it's, a, it's a complicated pathway. Okay? This is the first time that you've seen it, unless you've been looking at my old lectures, in which case you may have seen it before. But um, the important thing is this is purely reciprocal. Either the PFK2 is active or the FBPase2 is active. There's no situation where they're both active. One is favoring the synthesis of F26BP. One is favoring the breakdown of F26BP. As we move to the right, that's stimulated by epinephrine. As we move to the left, that is stimulated by insulin. Thoughts? Questions? Yes, ma'am. So the two, um, the two, I guess, I don't know if you call them mechanisms, but reactions going on inside merely show you that one is stimulating the breakdown and one is stimulating the production of it? That's correct. Okay. So this is showing you that here, this FBPase2 is active and it's, it's catalyzing the breakdown. Okay. This is showing you that the PFK2 is active and that's stimulating the synthesis. Make sense? It's a complicated figure, and most students I find don't like it, but it actually has a lot of cool information there. I don't really mess with the stuff that's in the um, boxes there because I find that sort of 
says what you already uh, learned from the, um, the diagram itself. Now tomorrow I will talk about glycogen metabolism and what you will see is that glycogen metabolism overlays some of this because phosphoprotein phosphatase affects glycogen metabolism. Protein kinase A affects glycogen metabolism. And so what cells are doing is they're coordinating a response, okay, that the body needs to do. This is a hormonal response that the body is responding to. We have to think, and if students frequently find it confusing because they think of, wow, I need all this energy, okay, why should I be um, favoring the synthesis of glucose? Epinephrine is stimulating the synthesis of glucose. That's what this figure is telling you. Okay? That's a little confusing. Why is it doing this? Well, the reason, maybe I shouldn't say there, I'll be right in your way. Uh, the reason it's doing that is we're looking and we're thinking here mostly about a liver cell. Epinephrine is stimulating production of glucose, whether it is by the breakdown of glycogen or the gluconeogenesis pathway. Here, glucose is being made by gluconeogenesis. We'll see tomorrow that epinephrine will stimulate the breakdown of glycogen. Both of those produce glucose. And that glucose goes out into the bloodstream, goes to the muscle cells, where muscle cells can use it very badly. On the other hand, when glucose concentrations get high, insulin says, we've got to get rid of all this glucose. We take it in the body, and we'll see tomorrow that we'll either make glycogen or we will break it down in glycolysis, both of which reduce the concentration of glucose. Okay, no other questions? Is that too much for one day? All right, what I want to do, uh, if there are no other questions, uh, and by the way, some of you have said, if you want to can you find me in my office, et cetera? Yes, in fact, I think tomorrow's a fairly good day for finding me in my office. Uh, but if you want to set up an appointment, send an email to me, I'll be happy to do that uh, with you. Um, what I want to do today is finish with a cycle that most students find actually quite easy to understand based on what you've learned. So we'll move from something that's fairly complicated to something that's fairly easy, and that'll be the last thing I will talk about today. I do have a song uh, that's my favorite song, and we'll do that one today after I finish this. Okay? This is the Cori cycle. The Cori cycle... Um, schematically looks like this, but I'm going to tell you about the Cori cycle in words, all right? So let's imagine that I am going out and running the half marathon that I ran earlier this year, okay? For an old guy like me, and without, without too much blood supply, uh, that meant that my muscle cells were starving for oxygen after I probably went about 100 yards, okay? You don't get too far and those muscle cells are wanting oxygen. Well, what happens when my muscle cells start running out of oxygen? They've got to keep glycolysis going, so they've got to go through this redox balancing business, and the redox balancing, they're making NAD, and they're making NAD by converting pyruvate into lactate, right? Well, lactate turns out to be a biological dead end for cells. The only thing, they can do with, only thing that cells can do with lactate is convert it back to pyruvate. Well, they can't convert it back to pyruvate if they don't have any oxygen. So these muscle cells throw their arms up in the air, and they throw the lactate out into the bloodstream. All right? So the muscle cells have taken glucose, they've made pyruvate, they've made lactate, and they said, I'm done with this, and they kick the lactate out. Some people think that the lactate produced by exercising muscle cells is what causes sore muscles after heavy exertion. That's actually argued by people, so I won't, go, I won't weigh in one way or the other but actively respiring muscle cells are producing lactate. It goes into the bloodstream. Lactate travels back to the liver, and the liver grabs it. Why does the liver grab it? Well, the liver is very close to the heart. The liver has a very good blood supply. It's not oxygen limited. And it says, okay, I will take lactate because I'm getting a message that our blood glucose levels are getting low, I can make glucose in two ways. One, I can break down glycogen. The other, I've got plenty of oxygen. Why don't I start making glucose 
starting with lactate. And so the, muscle, uh, the liver cell takes that lactate, converts it to pyruvate. It takes that pyruvate and converts it into glucose. And the liver, says, liver cell says, wow, I don't need all this glucose. What am I going to do? I dump it out into the bloodstream. And where does the glucose go? To the muscle cell. So we've just now seen a cycle that's actually occurring between the liver cell and the target muscle cells. It's giving the muscle cells very, very importantly needed glucose to keep the muscle cell going because the muscle cell is keeping the organism alive if it's running away from a grizzly bear. And that's a very useful thing for the liver to do. Gets to the muscle, of course, the muscle takes glucose and converts it back down to lactate, and you get the idea. So we see a cycle going on as a result of this exercise activity. This cycle was named for a famous couple known as the Corys, and they were a husband and wife team uh, who discovered this. They did a lot of work relative to glycogen and uh, metabolism of sugar in the body. OK, makes sense? OK, let's do a song, and we'll call it a day. As I said, this is my favorite song. It's called Gluconeogenesis, and it's to the tune of supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. When cells have lots of ATP and NADH2, they strive to store this energy as sugar. Yes, they do. Inside of mitochondria, they start with pyruvate, carboxylating it to make oxaloacetate. Oh, gluconeogenesis is so exhilarating. Memorizing it can really be exasperating. Liver cells require it, so there's no need for debating. Gluconeogenesis is so exhilarating. Glucose, glucose, come to be. Glucose, glucose, come to be. Exaloacetate has got to turn to PEP, employing energy that comes from breaking GTP. From there it goes to make a couple phosphoglycerates, exploiting enolase and mutase catalytic traits. Oh, gluconeogenesis is liver specialty, producing sugar for the body most admirably. Six ATPs per glucose is the needed energy. Gluconeogenesis is liver specialty. Oh, glucose, glucose, joy to me. Glucose, glucose, joy to me. Converting phosphoglycerate to 1,3-BPG requires a phosphate that includes ATP energy. Reduction with electrons gives us all an NAD. And G3Ps isomerize to make DHAP. Oh, gluconeogenesis is anabolic bliss. Reversing seven mechanisms of glycolysis. To do well on the final, students have to learn all this. Gluconeogenesis is anabolic bliss. Oh, glucose, glucose factory, glucose, glucose factory. The aldolase reaction puts together pieces so a fructose molecule is made with two phosphates in tow. And one of these gets cleaved off by a fructose phosphatase unless F26BP is acting, blocking pathways. Oh, gluconeogenesis, a pathway to revere that makes a ton of glucose when it kicks into high gear. The cell's a masterminding metabolic engineer. Gluconeogenesis, a pathway to revere. Oh, glucose, glucose, jubilee. Glucose, glucose, jubilee. From F6P to G6P, that is the final phase. The enzyme catalyzing it is anisomerase. When G6P does phosphate and a glucose, it becomes inside the tiny endoplasmic reticulums. Oh, gluconeogenesis is not so very hard. I know that on the final, we will not be caught off guard because our professor lets us use a filled out index card. Gluconeogenesis is not so very hard. All right, and here are the note cards. All right, so come up, get a note card, and you're off and running. What's that? You can use both sides. You can use the edge if you can fit it on the edge. There you go. There you go. There you go. There you go. Enjoy. See how tiny you can write. You bet. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. There you go. Take care. There you go. Yes, yes indeed. Have fun. Yep, you bet. Take care. Yep.
Yeah. There you go. When are you going to post today's lecture? I'm sorry? When are you going to post today's lecture? Um, I'll get it, try to get up tonight, definitely. Yeah. Get up as quickly as I can, I can assure you. Is it both sides? Both sides. Do the edge if you want. Okay, thank you. You got one, that's right. There you go. There you go. Everybody get no cards? No card? Go, sir. Did you get one? No, thank you. Okay. Everybody got one? Did you get one? Did you get a note card? Did you get a note card? Okay, I guess he did. <laughs> and think about a song that's going in your head right through. So I can use it for eCampus test, right? Oh, yes, you can, sure. Yeah, yeah. eCampus, okay, yeah. Did you happen to mention when the commentary would be graded in the class? That was like um, I thought it would be graded by now, so it, it, it should definitely be graded by tomorrow. Uh, but um, the key is posted outside my office, and you right. can uh, you can go access that. Yeah, we so. got a copy in recitation too. So. Okay, okay. Thanks. Oh, that's right. Anna, Anna did that, didn't she? Yeah. I was wondering if you were going to your office after this so I could pick yes. up my exam. Yes. To pick the, up your... The corrections. Oh, they're in the BB, BB office. Oh, you go, go on over there, yeah. Much. I'm sorry? Is my office still open? No, 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 their office. Uh, it should be open till five. Yeah. Okay. Let's turn that.